Right. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Click Analytics Tour. My name is Neil Thorne. I'm one of the sector managers at Ametis. Uh, for those of you that aren't aware of Ametis, we help our customers get more value from their data with end-to-end, -end, multi cloud data integration and analytic solutions from Click. Uh, we're an elite partner for Click, and we offer a full suite of services from implementation and development through to ongoing consultancy, training and support. Uh, and as the UK's largest dedicated Click consultancy, we help our clients build intuitive Click applications that unlock the full potential of their business data. Now, some of you will know that for the last three years, we've held this event in the marvellous surroundings at the Belfry Golf and Country Club in Warwickshire. Uh, sadly, due to the virus outbreak, we can't all get together this year. And so I'm afraid you're having to put up with me in our spare room, hastily converted uh, earlier this year into an office. Now, I, I suspect these conditions are going to be with us for some time and we're all going to have to learn to live with it, unfortunately. But on a personal note, uh, I am amazed how quickly people have switched to this new way of communicating via Zoom, Teams, Skype, etc. And it's simply become the norm. Uh, it does mean I have a, a wardrobe of unused suits, uh, but it also means that my dog, Harvey, uh, he's getting used to far more walks. Um, he has been told not to bark during today, so hopefully he behaves throughout the sessions. Anyway. I digress. On today's uh, WebEx, firstly, thank you very much for finding the time to be with us. It is appreciated and we're confident you'll find the, se the sessions useful and informative. So we have a lot to get through. Uh, so let's begin with the agenda. So the agenda is certainly packed today. Uh, first up, is MD of Ametis, Andy Patrick, who will present the keynote that examines the latest trends driving data strategies in 2020. Uh, it will showcase Click's latest product innovations, and it will demonstrate uh, how organizations can get to insights quickly and see the whole story that lives within their data. Uh, we'll have a short break at 11 o'clock for you to grab a coffee, pick up some emails, and then at 11.15, we will have what I'm sure will be an interesting demonstration by our partners from Motio, showing how to introduce version control into your click developments using Sotere. At 11.30, we will have our customer forum and Q&A. Special thanks to Andy, Megan, and Sarah for being with us today to talk through how Click has benefited their organizations. Um, there will be the, the facility to ask questions of the panel, and we will try to get through as many of those as we can in the time allowed. Um, please do start to log your questions within the chat and the question section um, within the GoToWebinar app, and we will um, bring those together to ask the panelists at that time. Lunch will be at 12.30, and at 1.30 there will be a choice of two hands-on workshops led by Alex Walker, our operations director, and Chris Lofthouse, our head of consulting, and Click Luminary. Uh, we plan to finish the day around 2.30 to 3 o'clock, depending on how much fun you're having on the workshops, I guess. Now, um, all attendees today will receive a copy of our ebook, How to Unlock the Power of Your Business Data. Uh, it summarizes the solutions and services available from Click and Ametis, as well as providing uh, more links to our website and to our toolkit, which is free for all Click users and includes tips and tricks, advice, and tools to help with developments, amongst other things. Um, the ebook also includes a video case study I'd encourage you to watch. And that covers the work we did with a company called Penlon, a manufacturer of ventilators that the government selected early on in the COVID crisis to be part of a consortium to significantly expand production to meet the expected need. 
Um, Ametis worked with Click to generate the licenses and get resources into place, all free of charge, uh, to help boost the manufacturing process and help them move from building two to three ventilators per week to produce in excess of the 10,000 that were required. And it's an interesting watch, I recommend it. Uh, I'd also like to draw your attention to the feedback form available within the app. Um, that will enable uh, you to let us know what you thought of the presentations and if you need any further information from us. So you've heard me waffle on for long enough, so let me hand over now to the MD of Ametis, Andy Patrick, for the keynotes and the demonstration. Enjoy the day. Good morning, everybody. I just wanted to thank all of you guys for taking some time out of your busy working week to spend some time with us on this go to webinar. I will keep it brief. We'll, we'll take feedback from you and we've got a product demonstration to do, but I have got about five or six slides to go through. So I'm not going to keep you too long on them. We'll spend more time in product. We're going to try and keep this day as interactive as it can be. Uh, with all the challenges that we face doing this remotely, we would love to see you face to face at the Belfry, as Neil has already said. But if you have got questions as we go along, do put them down in there and I'll incorporate some of those answers into the demonstration and be guided by what you want to see as well. So we're quite happy to be fleet of foot to do that. So um, let's crack on and go through this PowerPoint and let's keep it as, as brief as we possibly can. The theme of the PowerPoint and the theme of the keynote is really about not just getting but accelerating uh, the business value that you can get by using analytics and we know that that is a particular challenge for a lot of organizations it's certainly easier said than it is done for most organizations, um, th this challenge is a real one and, and companies struggle to make actionable data available in the very first instance, let alone turn that actionable data into business value. And we've seen studies where companies are only using 10% of their data, that's 10% of business relevant data being analyzed. And putting it into action is really tough as well. Only 32% of executives can create value from data. And it's especially tough when only a quarter of the workforce knows what to do with it. So these studies have said that only 24% of decision makers feel like they have the right data literacy skills to get value from their data. So, Hopefully this is where we come in. We help organizations take on those complex challenges of transforming their data into business value. And we do that by leveraging the Click platform. And there's many aspects to the Click platform. We start off with data integration, not a main focus for today, but certainly happy to answer questions that we will be touching on some of it. But this is where you can start to free up and find all of the data that you should be using. We then move that data into the analytics platform. Again, looking at the polls, uh, a lot of you are using ClickSense, a few of you using ClickView, some of you not using Click at all, but you'll be used to the analytics platform, ClickSense, with its associative technology that gives you the freedom to explore your data, understand it and take action on it. But another important point is supporting individuals and people through that journey. I think our customer success approach, our training, our workshops, tips, tricks, hints, ebooks, metistalgittalk.com, our consultants' expertise all contribute to helping our customers become better informed and make them more data literate. So this data literacy is needed because of the evolution that we've seen in business intelligence systems and how they're being used. We're currently in this third generation of BI. Um, people that have joined us before for these sessions will have seen this, so I'll keep it brief, but for those that haven't, we started off with this first generation of BI systems that was centrally managed. It was complex stacks of information 
specialists in different areas needed to be involved and the primary output of that centralized system was just static reports which is fine it provides a answer to a known question or a known set of questions but that led to follow-up questions that were a lot harder uh, to go and answer and systems were difficult to use uh, there was extensive training that were needed they were slow to set up slow to adapt slow to turn around the answers and only 25 percent of business users ever got any value out of that first generation of bi and the response to this of course was the second generation of bi this is often referred to as data discovery and click pioneered the way um, during this second generation it ultimately evolved the self-service capabilities for business users where they would go and select the tool of choice um, at the different line of business to analyze their data freeing up exploration rather than just looking at static reports and this self-service approach maybe hit 50 percent of business users rather than the 25 and although that's considerably better I think many organizations have struggled to govern these myriad of tools that they've got in place and they've lacked a consistent data strategy as part of that second generation. So now this is giving rise, of course, to the third generation, uh, which we're calling the democratized approach. And it builds off the second generation, but firmly believe that organizations can do more and better things with data they can achieve a fully data-driven state that starts to unlock the potential in their data and just wanted to give you a couple of examples of organizations that are benefiting from this democratized approach if you've signed anything electronically in the last decade it stands a chance that it's come from DocuSign they're a they're a true leader in their field uh, but they're also a leader in the use of analytics um, ClickSense was deployed to Docu, uh, DocuSign and they've enabled over 90 percent adoption so think about that in comparison to just that 25 percent uh, where it was the first generation of BI we've now got 90 percent of um, knowledge workers, users that can make more informed decision based upon the data that they're seeing. And that's a permanent advantage that they will keep with them. They're moving on to Volvo, the Swedish car manufacturer. Their uh, innovation is in safety. Um, they've been able to measure the benefits in their democratized approach through increased customer satisfaction and cost savings. And only by having everybody making informed decisions, insightful decisions, is it possible to balance those two opposing forces. And finally, the NHS that we have there, the National Health Service, they're better able to understand and predict where they'll see large health complex system pressures so that they can better meet the needs of their patients and I think in these unprecedented times that Neil's talked about already not just frontline healthcare workers but all organizations need the best possible tools in place in order to make the right decisions for their business so why click and not others and, and I appreciate that a lot of you are using click, click already so you'll know this um, but I will mention associative difference associative technology a fair few times on this keynote and demonstration um, just describing that in the easiest way possible is Click's associative difference that they have stops users having tunnel vision when they're looking at their dashboards. It gives users a peripheral view. They can see more, they can know more. And if we take the traditional SQL based approach, traditional SQL visualization tools, a query is something that is constructed in order to return a positive match to that particular query it brings back only the data that matches that that has been asked of 
And that now focuses the user on a very narrow set of results. If we contrast that to click, and you'll see this in the demonstration, because of its associative technology, not only does it return those positive matches, those things that are related to that selection state, but it also adds that layer of peripheral vision where the data that somewhat matches, so that that we see in light gray, and the data that doesn't match at all comes through. And you'll see that in the demonstration. Second off, and, and why you might choose Click is augmented analytics. So this is a second major differentiator for us. Um, and these AI capabilities are being used in all different use cases across the analytics platform. And whether that's conversational analytics being embedded into collaboration tools, or just the ability to have uh, freeform data exploration within a dashboard, or drilling down into a pre-configured dashboard that has been built for you, this AI element is not separate. It's not a black box that sits outside of the system. It's not an add-on feature to the product. It's fully embedded in the platform. And it's built upon that associative technology and the cognitive engine that I'll come on and talk about. We find that that just empowers users to find insights much quicker within their data. And then an important point as well, and we're talking to a, <clears throat> a couple of customers about this, um, you know, in these last couple of months, is embedding at the point of decision. So the platform can embed the analytics where it's needed most. It can take the visualizations, the KPIs, the charts that you use in your dashboards, and it can embed them in the systems that people are using on a day-to-day -day basis. It puts that decision maker in a much better position to make the right decision because they've got all the information to hand. So it leads to agile working and, and confident decision making. And the fact that Click invested in building a analytical platform first is paying dividends. They built the intuitive self-service interface on top of that platform. And that enables people to reach all of the data that they need, but also make those informed decisions and pushing information out to third parties like customers, vendors, and their partners as well through this embedding capability. So I just wanted to dive deeper into that associative difference very quickly. You know, this is click sense. This is what we have to shout about. It runs on this associative engine that has been powering click for the last 20 years, and it is unrivaled. It's unmatched. Um, you know, we think about the limitations of SQL and relational databases. You know, we say this each year, but but it's still true. And that, that truth is that relational databases and SQL queries were just not designed to support modern analytics. Most visualization tools rely on this SQL query approach, and that's used for their fundamental architecture for modeling data and, and supporting the interactive analysis that people have. And we think we just find that this limits users greatly it limits them in the questions that they can ask. It limits them in the paths that they can explore and the breadth of data sources that they can bring together and combine. And people get stuck with this tunnel vision that I've talked about, where they can only see narrow sets of data and just the values that positively match that query criteria that has been sent to them. So there's, there's no global context to the exploration that they're having. Visualizations don't update together. Um, you know, you can't have good global search. That's all limited. And organizations struggle to fully combine data sources using just SQL joins. Relational databases also suffer by this approach because if you have to run consecutive queries concurrently against a database, there's only going to be performance issues with that. 
And as you can probably guess, Click does things differently. And it's at the heart of the Click platform um, that there is this associative engine and it's been built from the ground up. There's nothing quite like it. It indexes and, and understands all of the associations in your data across all of the different data sources. And I think when you see the demonstration today, it will be fair to say that users of all skill levels, including mine, um, can freely explore the data and get to the answers that they need right from building that data from scratch as well. And it's because of the associative engine that all the relationships show clearly to the end user. And it's not just returning those positive matches. We can't stress this enough. The hidden insights in your data are often found in the gray data, those things that just do not match your criteria that you've set. Again, we'll touch on that in the demonstration, but it's a really important part of why Click is unique. We also combine the associative technology that we have within Click with the cognitive engine that I've mentioned. And this adds a, a layer of artificial intelligence to enhance the ability of people to uncover the insights that they need out of the data. So this insight advisor capability in ClickSense enhances just about everything that you do across the analytics lifecycle it generates and suggests insights both visually and associates information for you. It helps end users become better at what they do. And because this associative engine manages a global context, that selection state that I've talked about, at each step of the user's journey through Click, it knows all of the data that is associated and also that data that's unrelated within that context. And that can be factored into the machine analysis, making those suggestions more relevant and more insightful. That context awareness combined with algorithmic techniques help users get previously unseen insights. And as I've said, this is unique to Click. It's not possible without access to a complete set of enterprise data, the ability to understand the associations within that data and the right vehicle to explore that and that vehicle being ClickSense. So if analytics is a separate activity, there is a bigger chance that it will fail. It is in our minds essential that the analytics occurs at the point of decision. So bringing it back to that, you know, embedding solutions into other applications, physically embedding those analytics into business applications to give better context for the user. Click built that analytics platform with open and standard APIs that enables that to happen. So you can put that analytics anywhere. And, and that can be taken even further by allowing Click to directly talk to other engines such as R or Python, so that maybe lay users like myself can benefit from sophisticated models in a real-time way. And just to give a, an example of that, you might have um, a user of a CRM system where they can see the analysis on a specific customer, maybe including the likeliness to churn. And that's being driven from an R algorithm and displayed using ClickSense visualizations, all embedded in that CRM package, showing other customer information. It empowers the user. I am gonna crack on with the demonstration shortly, um, but just wanted to talk about the innovation that's come along with ClickSense since its inception. And we'll just pick out a, uh, a couple of these, I'm not going to go into all 12 aspects, but if we look at that Insight Advisor, this is the suggestions engine, if you like, um, or the suggestions provided by that cognitive engine. So that's visual insights, charts and visualizations that are auto-generated and prioritized based upon the data set that's in there. And that gets further refined through a natural language search. Again, we'll show that as we go through some of the demonstration. 
Those associative insights highlight the most statistically significant information to you of things that are associated, but maybe more importantly, things that are not associated. Um, moving on to accelerated creation. I noticed that some of you use ClickView. Uh, most of you using ClickSense, don't know what version of ClickSense, but I think it's fair to say that using this AI power in order to automate um, not just data visualizations, but data preparation has enabled um, the end user to get to insights quicker. Our colleague, Chris Lofthouse, who's running one of the workshops a little later on, did a blog on this uh, not too long ago, examining the time that it took to get the same data analyzed in ClickView and then in recent versions of ClickSense. Have a look at the blog for yourself, but the results are really interesting. And with each new version, um, that time it just gets quicker and quicker to analyze that data. Um, looking at new visualization, so again, since it first started, I think there have been an addition of maybe 15 uh, additional new chart types. Um, there's multi layered maps um, for the visualizations, also improvements in that kind of geo analytics technology that Click has, and, and numerous visualization improvements um, in all areas like formatting and trend lines on charts, trellising, uh, modifiers, um, accumulations, and, and many more. And we'll touch on some of them. And finally, maybe touching on data catalog that I will get the chance to demonstrate to you. This is an integrated um, catalog for users to browse and select the data that they want to gain access to. So it can be a different starting approach for a self-service user. It's optional, it's not mandatory, but we'll touch on that shortly. And then the dynamic view capability gives users the ability to dynamically reload certain charts um, using advanced data sources like Databricks or Snowflake. So you can have that real-time experience of information sat within a dashboard. And then I think it's apt to just mention quickly Enterprise SaaS. So that's what I'll be showing to you now. Um, again, I notice on the poll that most of you are client managed or as we like to say, on-premise. Um, but some of you might be running within um, your own cloud on AWS, Azure, or wherever it might be. Um, but I want to highlight some of the capabilities that sit within Clicks Cloud. So thank you for sitting through that keynote. Um, hopefully, I kept it brief enough for you all to stay joined with us. And I'm now going to go into a demonstration of ClickSense. So my eyes will be everywhere because I've got multiple screens, um, but we'll see different aspects of that good stuff in action. So my starting point for this demonstration is my browser. <clears throat> I happen to use Google Chrome and we navigate to this Click Cloud Hub. So this can be a one-stop shop for all the information that you need. What we can see here, <clears throat> for those of you that are using ClickSense, you'll be used to streams. Within Click's cloud infrastructure, we use something called Spaces. But as I've navigated to this, this is my landing page, and I can see all of those applications, all the different things. If I go on to Links, <clears throat> This really is a great way to enable a hybrid approach. So what you might have in place is ClickSense sitting on your infrastructure, so client managed, and some of that, some of those applications being pushed up into Clicks Cloud, but not all of them because of data size restrictions or wherever it might be. But if you want a one-stop shop for people to go to one interface to say, where's all my analysis, then you can link back to other external links, as you can see here. And this might be a ClickSense application that sits on Clicks demonstration site on your infrastructure. So people don't have to navigate to different URLs to get that information. 
If I jump onto apps, then if I scroll to the bottom, again, uh, one or two of you, I think, were using ClickView or still using ClickView. Great thing about Clicks Cloud is that we've now got the ability to run a QVW, which is a ClickView application on Clicks infrastructure. So this is ClickView. I'm not going to go into the detail. That's not the area that we're focusing in on today. But again, rather than having to navigate to different areas, you can get to that information that you need from one place. If we then look at charts, this is a great tool for management, I believe. There will be several applications, ClickSense applications that people have access to that might be sitting in a cloud environment. And it could be five or six different KPIs or charts that really want to be monitored on a um, daily basis. So when you're in an application, you can right click choose to monitor that chart in the hub and it will reside there in your area where that data is reloaded, all of this information gets updated real time. I can then click on that chart to view it in more detail so I get a larger view of that and obviously I can start my navigation process off by clicking view in application. So this will take me to that ClickSense application where that chart has been um, selected from just to show, I can right click and click monitoring hub, which I've already done, but it gives me the other context that I now need around looking at the other charts that support that particular view that we had in the hub. All of the KPIs are on there. Talked about the associative difference. So let's see it in action. The easiest way to show off some of that um, associative working is just to make selections. And we don't have lots of fields um, in play within ClickSense because we can interact with all of the charts. So I go and make a selection and then before I even leave that chart, all of my other charts and KPIs are now in the context of that selection. Everything has got a selection state in place and those bits of information are updated instantly. Not just on the page that we're on, but if I navigate to the next sheet as well, then all of those visualizations have been updated as part of me making that selection as well. Another great way to show some of the associative difference is using search. Now, again, using search means that I don't have to understand the underlying architecture of where this data is coming from. I can just search for the values that are important. And I can see here that snack food is doing quite well. And I know I've got a meeting coming up with our European head of sales. So I can start searching for Europe and cookies. And Click will try and finish off that search suggestion for you, but it will also go away and find the best matches. So we can see here that we found Europe in region and cookies in product subcode, but we've also found the word cookies in product description. So I could get really granular with the searching that I want to do and find the data that's relevant. I'm just going to take the first suggestion that's there. And again, the whole dashboard updates in front of you. Um, so you can see that within context. If we then look at what's happened there, we've got uh, selections across the toolbar, across the breadcrumb bar at the top. And we can see that we've got the selection shown in green. So we've selected cookies. I talked about in the uh, presentation, the selected out values or the values in light gray. So these are values in light gray that we've selected out. We've specifically said, I'm not selecting those by selecting cookies. But because they're light gray, we know that they do have a somewhat association with Europe and those two companies that I'd selected. As we scroll to the bottom, we get further information that other systems just don't provide you with. And this is the unrelated data. So this is the grayed out data that 
is not associated with the selection state that I've got in. So this is telling me that within Europe, these two companies were not selling hot dogs and sausages, which might be an area of concern for us if you know we're having a conversation with Germany, for instance. So we can get to that information quickly and easily. And by seeing that unrelated data, we get better insight out of the dashboard. OK, that's some of the associative technology that we've got, but I wanted to focus maybe in on some of the cognitive capabilities as well. So if I release my selection here, I can move on to maybe the next sheet. So again, just seeing some other visualizations that you can put in within ClickSense, some of the updates to the visualizations as well. But I can see here in my store sales by company that there are some stores that have got very low, if not zero sales. So by interacting with the chart, I can go and make that selection and try and find out what's going on. And I think that this really does make an important point about that query based approach and other visualization tools. Effectively, we've sent a query to the system now where we've narrowed down the results that are coming back into the visualization so this is working like your tableaus like your power bi's like your other visualization tools at this point in time and i'm getting a limited amount of insight from that selection it's not telling me much it's not allowing me to really understand what's going on there but because click enables you to see more we can go on to selections and we can understand what selections have been made in green we can see the light gray that's in there as well we can also see the white data so that is the associated values with that selection state across all the different fields that are in there along with the gray data that's unrelated so this cognitive engine now has been running in the background and it's allowing me to look at the different measures that we have in place and giving me that statistically significant um, insights that I talked about during the PowerPoint. And those things that are related just don't help. In this instance, it's telling me that this contributes nothing towards our sales margin amount. Now, if you were stuck with that alone, then you're off onto a separate search and trying to find different things out. But because Click gives you the hidden insights, that information about the gray data, we can scroll down and we can start seeing that only 18, uh, sorry, only two out of the 20 different product groups are being sold into those stores. And maybe just as importantly, only 21 out of my 927 sales reps are actually selling into those stores. So we've gone from, and, and I can go and see that by revealing the data, um, I can see those, I can apply that as my next search criteria, I can contact those salespeople, I can speak to their managers, I can find out what's going on. So we've gone really from identifying um, something that looked a little bit odd to actually being able to take specific action within the dashboard to hopefully rectifying uh, a problem that we might find. So that's a little bit of insight into the associative capabilities and the cognitive capabilities that sit within a dashboard. Uh, and we will come back to that. But I wanted to take that back a step now and build you a dashboard from scratch using some of those associative and cognitive capabilities that sit within the Click platform. Now, my starting point for that is going to be Click data catalyst, a click catalog. Essentially, this is a shop front to all of the data that sits within your organization, whether that be different data sources, but also it's QVDs. Now, again, lots of people on this webinar today will be existing users of Click, and you will have no doubt face the challenge of working with QVDs. They are very powerful um, and they're optimized for loading data and they're a fantastic way to get information into Click. But 
there's not always a great way to store those QVDs. You might put them in two different folders. What Click Catalog offers is a way for you to put quantitative measures against those QVDs. So I can just search for QVDs and all of our QVDs become accessible there with all of the quantitative measures and I can get some further information about that QVD in place. So maybe looking at some of the metadata that sits around that QVD. If I go back, I think one of the great things about that is that it unlocks the data that has previously been just a preserve of ClickSense or ClickView. So once you have these QVDs within Click Data Catalyst, that information can then be pushed to other visualization tools. And we're not here to promote Tableau or Power BI today at all, but we do need to talk about the agnostic way that some of the Click Data integration tools work and they enable you to get information out to the visualization tool of your choice. Hopefully the visualization tool of your choice is, is ClickSense, of course. But we've got this Amazon-like experience where I can go and search for the data that's important to me. So if I wanted to look at sales data, I do a simple search and I then get this information presented back to me. So if we're going to focus in on this SAP data, we've got inf information that tells me about the quality and the popularity of that data. It's used a quite, lot, quite a lot in this organization. But again, if we delve a little bit deeper and view that entity, then we can look at the lineage of that data. So by doing that, we get a visual representation of where that data has come from and how it's come to be uh, sat within a QVD. So um, we can see here, I'm, I'm just going to change this to maybe seven levels deep and update the levels. So we can see that this data originates in our SAP database. It comes through to click replicate and it probably comes through using what we call CDC, so change data capture. This is where Click Replicate, this is part of Click's data integration platform, will look at the log files that are being generated from updates, modifications, deletions that are going on within the SAP system. And it will take those log file changes every time that they are made, and it will push that information through, in this case, to Click Compose. So another part of the data integration platform where Click enables the ability to transform that data, get it business ready and automatically populate data warehouses. So it's not just taking the data and putting it into a holding area where you've got a separate process in order to populate that data warehouse. It's actually doing that automation process for you. So in this case, it's going through to Snowflake, but it could be that this is going through to a SQL data warehouse or going through to Databricks or wherever that might be. We then follow that all the way through and it eventually creates a claims QVD, but essentially some of that information, as you can see here, is being pushed out to Tableau Desktop, for instance. So we can see the full lineage of what's happening with that data. If I step back a stage, then we can see the sample data that's coming out of that SAP sales. So what we can see here is the breadth and depth of that data to make sure it is the information that we want. We've got different output options for that data that you know we probably won't use in this instance, but what we could possibly use is Click Catalog's integrated capability to get that into the tool of choice. So I'm going to add this to my cart and I could add multiple data sources, um, multiple entries into the cart and then once I've done that I can take action on that data that sits within the catalogue that I've got here. So the actions here as you can see, sorry, we can publish that to Power BI, we can publish it to Tableau Desktop, 
obviously what I'm interested in is publishing this data set to my Click Cloud Services data files area. So this is a great place where you might start your self-service journey off if you need a cataloging um, function because of the amount of data that you have, the amount of different data sources and maybe QVDs that you've got. It's also great if you want to make that locked in QVD data available to other visualization tools that you use in your organization. So I'm going to jump back into the Click Cloud platform now and jump back to the hub. And we'll take that a little bit further. So if I go into my personal area and look at the apps that I've got, I have a QAT Ametis app. So we're going to open that application up. And what Click wants you to do is say, where am I going to get my data from in order to build visualizations, to build this dashboard? So as I click on that, it will open up all of the different connectors that we've got available to us at that point in time. Now, just to make a point here as well, um, my colleague Alex Walker, who is also running one of the workshops this afternoon, um, wrote a great blog about a week ago, a couple of weeks ago, on a new tool that has been released by Click called Click Data Transfer. And if you are thinking about getting your data into the cloud, utilizing Click's infrastructure for some of that processing, using some of the functionality that I've shown already or that I'm going on to show, then Click Data Transfer is an ideal tool to help that because there might be some restrictions about I have to open up the VPN and connect or if we've got firewall issues. Click Data Transfer, and I do urge you to go and read this blog, is a utility that you can install on your local server that will help you push data from your client managed, from your on-premise um, setup. It will push that data in different formats up to the cloud, and that could be a QVD format where you're left to do your transformation of that data in the cloud. So have a look at that blog, really interesting and a great free tool that Click have provided. Um, in this instance, we've pushed out data from Click Data Catalyst to the data files that sit in Click Cloud Services. So I'm going to look at those data files and we can see that SAP sales and distribution data. So I'm going to select that and of course I can make some modifications at this point in time, including fields, excluding fields and renaming them. But right now I just want to answer a few questions about that data. So I'm going to put it into click and I'm going to try and answer some of those questions as quickly as possible. So eight seconds um, has been done and now I'm going to jump straight into insights. So again, this is the cognitive engine working where what it can do is generate insights for you. So being a lazy user maybe, um, I don't, I want click to do some of that thinking for me. So by clicking on generate, generate insights, it's pushing all of that data set through the cognitive engine and it's returning to me some visualizations that might make my life easier. It's interpreted that data and enabled me to add things straight away. So I can see this kind of multi-layered map that's summing up sales and cost of sale by um, country and city, and that could be interesting. So I'm going to add that to my sheet. So quickly and easily, we've started the build of our dashboard and I can take that further by saying, well, I want to get a bit more focused in. So I'm going to look at customers uh, and I want to look at sales by customer. So we can make selections on the data sets, the fields that we have available to us. And again, Click will generate those insights for us. And I can see that we have a nice, simple looking bar chart here. If I expand that out, um, I can interact with that as well. So I might just want to look at our top 10 sales, top 10 customers within sales at this point in time. So we're a bit more focused in. And I can see that you know it's done some of sales and this is something that I'll want to use on a regular basis. So this is a best practice approach for us as well because we can see the sum of sales working in action by looking at it on a chart 
So I'm going to create a master item from what I know is already working. And we can add that as new, and I don't want to label expression in there, we'll call it sales, and we've created our master measure. Now, I could have started that process off in a different area within master items and then added it to a chart, but you don't always know if that's the right formula that you've used, the right calculation. So this is a best practice way of creating master measures. We can see some details about what we learned there. We learned that sales is a measure. So this is clicks, machine learning, taking all of this into account so that it can offer up better suggestions as you get deeper and deeper into the build of that dashboard. Again, I'm going to add that to my sheet and then jump back into the sheet there. <clears throat> I'm also going to take a very quick drink. So we are halfway through building our dashboard here. And what we might want to do is add some additional data into this dashboard build. So I can jump into my data manager. And this really is a uh, well, I suppose it focuses our minds on this non-linear approach that Click has. We've got the ability to add data into a dashboard, build some visualizations on it, understand that we need to add more data in and then go and get that additional data to bolster the building of that dashboard without pushing everything through a data warehouse. So at this point in time, I'm going to add some additional data from my data files and we'll add some more sales and order data. This has um, several tables that are sat within it. So I'm just going to select those tables and say, I wanna bring all of that data through so we can add that data. And going back to the presentation that we did, I talked about, um, you know, the cognitive capabilities and the associative technology. That's uh, uh, this is an ideal place to talk about that. If I select that sales data, Click starts making suggestions for me about how I might want to associate that data. And notice I'm not joining that sales table onto any other tables, I'm associating it there is a world of difference between those two things that makes click different to the other visualization tools. So we can't stress that enough, but I can see here that the green circles going around show me where the best matches are for association and the orange or amber um, colors give me the you know secondary associations that I could make. Click has offered a load of suggestions up for me, so I'm just gonna preview those suggestions. And I can see it's created that data model. Now, this is going to work because it's a canned demonstration, but try this out with your own data. People that have used ClickSense before see this working and happening. I'm going to apply all of those suggestions as well. Now, at any point in time, if I wanted to see how sales is related to products, I can click on the rivet and I can understand that. I can see what other options were available for making that association, or I can make my own custom association if I know better than the system. So we're not saying that this is a closed off black box, you have to trust everything that Click does. It's working hand in hand with the end user, making that end user more proficient and you helping the system understand things better as well. So at that point in time, I'm just gonna load that additional data into the dashboard that we've already got. So it's creating all the search indexes at this point in time. So another nine seconds and we're back into editing the sheet. So we're now in edit mode in the browser of our ClickSense dashboard. And I'm going to reuse that master measure that we created earlier. So I drag and drop it onto the screen. Hopefully you can see that update. I'm just going to pause a second and hope there's not, in, ah, there we go. Um, hope there's not um, too many internet connections that I'm having, internet issues that I'm having. But we can see that because we have chart suggestions put on, Click has selected 
to use a KPI to represent that measure. So again, it's using its cognitive engine, its cognitive capabilities in order to help the end user. Um, I want to do a little bit more analysis than just have a KPI on there. So I can go to the available fields. I'm going to focus down on a particular table and I'm going to look at order date. And if I just scroll down there, I want to add year quarter to this particular KPI. And again, because I've got these chart suggestions switched on, click select for me the most appropriate visualization where I can look at other offerings as to how we want to present that data or I can just accept that suggestion that it's given to me. I'm going to switch chart suggestions off now <clears throat> and get into a bit more granular detail about those additions that I talked about. So if we turn off chart suggestions we mentioned trellising and trend lines and things like that. So under this measure of sales, if I explode that out, I've got the ability to quickly and easily add a trend line to my chart. Without doing complex calculations, I can add an average trend line. So there we see the average and we can see the fluctuations of our actuals against the average. We've got different average types as well. So if you wanted that being linear or fourth degree polynomial then you can put those averages in for this i just want to see those fluctuations against um what's the averages across the the four years of data that we've got in there we can also change the colors dash lines all those formatting capabilities another thing that i mentioned was um modifiers so what a modifier will allow you to do is change how a measure is calculated based upon the dimensions that are within the chart. So in this modifier, I could simply just put an accumulation on. Now that sometimes could have been a difficult bit of coding or calculation, but I could say I want accumulation and I want that a full accumulation and we can see exactly what's going on. We've got all different options there about moving averages, um, you know, custom accumulation over different steps. But in this instance, I'm just going to leave the modifier out of that. So we're almost through building our dashboard or the first sheet of our dashboard, should I say. Uh, and I'm going to jump back to the insight uh, to the insights, the insight advisor, if you like, in order to finish that off. One of the things that I mentioned was the natural language um, processing capabilities that sit within Click. Um, so what we can do is ask questions of the data um, without typing. So what I might say is sales and margin by customer for 2017 and 2019. So that suits me down to the ground because I don't like typing. <laughs> so we can ask these questions of this um, cognitive engine, this natural language processing and get insights back really quickly. I'm going to build on top of this shortly, but you can build trust from system to end user through doing this. If I click on the information that's associated with that, then Click has used that measure that we created. It's picked up sales. It's also found margin and customer in the fields. Now, if this were a production dashboard, I probably would have gone to the effort of creating a whole load of master measures and a whole load of master dimensions, and it would be using those. It's also using order date and applying a filter from the first of the first 2017 to the end of that year and the first of the first 2019 to the end of that year. So it's now excluding 2018 and 2020. It's giving me exactly what I asked for. And I might not have known how to create that particular calculation through the set analysis or the formulas that you put in within ClickSense. But that doesn't matter because Click has done that for me. So I'm going to add that to my sheet. I'm going to navigate back now to the sheet. Um, I'm conscious of time as well, so um, but I don't want to rush the product demo because you all wanted to see the product demo. Nobody wanted to see the keynote, but I'm done editing now. So I finished the first sheet of my dashboard and because everything stays in context, if I release my filter of customers there, 
everything updates within the selection state or the non-selection state that I have. So we can see that update real time, quick, easy insights out of data that's been sitting um, in our organization through that catalog. I'm going to jump back to the hub because this is something that I want to share with other people now. So if I go back to the hub, and the hub is behaving very slowly for me. But what we have here is a QAT Ametis hub. Uh, a Metis application sitting in the hub. Click on the burger bar or the ellipsis there. We've got the ability to do different things with that application now. So we can move it, duplicate it, make uh, edits to it. We can set a reload schedule of that if we want to pull that data through on a uh, regular basis. But I can as well just publish that. So I can publish that now to a different space where people have access to that. So pushing that through then gives other people the ability to go and interact with that application. If I then navigate through to that managed space, we can see our QAT. We can start to see, you know, the members that are within there as well. So we got, you know, about 60 odd members in there. I can see the roles that they have within that space to see how they can interact with that and how they can um, manage that. And I can also go and change um, those permissions and add members if I have the permissions to do so myself. Final thing that I want to cover as part of this demonstration is something that is sat within the Click Cloud service. Um, it does become available to our client managed, our, um, our um, on-premise users um, later on this year, but if you are using ClickSense um, cloud environment, if you are interested in using ClickSense cloud environment, then you get this functionality included within that. So it's Ask Insight Advisor, and it builds on top of that natural language processing that we showed within an application. In this instance, you don't have to be in a specific application. You can look at the different apps that are available to you. This is just a demo environment, so there's only a couple there. We're going to focus in on that app that I've been demoing on to start with, and that will present to you all of the different measures that we have available. So this helps the end user not forget what's in that application. We could simply just start typing in a question there and click um, advisor chat might ask We've got this data in several applications. Which one do you want to use? I can click on dimensions. I can click on help to give me some help, but the dimensions show me what's been set up in there. So I can start asking some simple questions about that application. What is my margin percentage? So again, rather than typing in and doing um, that on the keyboard, I'm going to use the um, microphone there in order to ask some simple questions and first time round click takes a bit of time to generate the, the relevant information but it's calculating other things at that point in time because it knows that you're going to ask further questions of that data it confirms back for me what my question was building up that trust and it gives me the answer to that our margin percentage is just 12 yeah, not not the greatest or maybe brilliant depends on what industry you're in i guess Show me sales by company. So this time round, um, I'm asking it to show me something. So I'm expecting it to come back with a chart. And this is a chart that you've seen already in the dashboard, one that we made our first selection on. And it's presented that information back to me with the most relevant chart. Show me sales by country. So if I ask a similar question, but I'm asking for it over country, Again, I expect Click to present that information back to me with the most relevant chart. And I can see a map now, but I also get this additional information telling me what the total sales amount is because I couldn't see that quite so easily from just looking at the chart. We take that maybe a step further. How many product codes are in perishable level low?
So what Click will do here is not just give me a KPI back of the perishable level low, it's going to offer up more information to me. So I get the bar chart again, showing me the breakdown of all of my products and the perishable level that they're in. It gives me additional information saying that we've got just under 2000 product codes in our product set. Um, 60% of them are in the low perishable level. So maybe that's a good thing. We haven't got too many in the high perishable level there. But what it will also do is give you that anomaly data. So we've got one product code that is not associated to a perishable level. And that's something I can take back upstream with those users that are setting up the system to say, OK, can we get this sorted out because we've got a data quality issue now as well. So the final thing I'll maybe ask of this is show me sales and number of units for 2018, excluding Germany. So again, demonstration data, but you will have an idea of the type of questions that you might want to ask. Um, we get it confirmed back to us. It's intuitive, it's easy, it's presenting me back with this scatter plot that's showing me sales, showing me number of units. I can see all of my countries plotted. I don't see Germany in there. We've got a date filter. Excellent. I'm going to explore this further. So when you explore that further, it will navigate back to the application where it's got that information from. It will put that information into the Insight Advisor where you could have done this, but obviously um, we're doing it outside of the application in the in the advisor chat and then there we know that we can go and create those master, master measures that are needed we can add that to the sheet we can see other visualizations within context to that filter and take things as far as we need to as part of our analysis so apologies maybe for overrunning a little there but wanted to give you the full experience of what's different about the SAS edition of Click. Hopefully we focused in there on some of the areas that you might not have seen before, as always, and it's difficult to do the way that we are. We want interaction. If you've got any questions and you want to direct them directly to me, hopefully you'll have my email. I'm more than happy to jump on separate demonstrations with any of you at any point in time, but carry on asking your questions in the chat. Um, when I get to look at them, we will start to address them. I know the guys have been dealing with that. And it's at this point in time that um, I'm going to jump back and hand over to Neil Thorne. Thank you all very much for sitting through the keynote. And uh, yeah, hopefully you get to see some of you guys face to face soon. Thank you. Um, so there is a whole world uh, behind and click application. And it could be that you have a data warehouse yourself. It, it might be that you collect and, and, and manipulate data in other ways. It could also be that you use click to extract and transform data from QVDs to other QVDs before it ends up in, an, in a certain application. Um, and and that can that can become um, pretty uh, pretty complex. Um, and whenever whenever click implementations are successful, and I've I've managed a few myself, then um, you run into certain issues. Um, it might be that the development process becomes uh, inefficient because you have so many apps, so many data flows, and you've got question. Hey, I make a change here. Uh, what is the impact of that change? or I make a change, uh, but um, I made a mistake. How do I repair this? Um, so you want to have some kind of, of source control. And I already saw that 50% that of the audience uh, said, oh, we do manual source control, um, maybe copying apps. Uh, um, and and, and that, that creates other problems with, uh, of course, having a cluttered environment. And then when organizations go uh, from a, a real dev to a real production environment and not deploying through streams, but really in different environments, you get into a deployment process that can be very cumbersome. Now, if click implementations is very successful, you have external parties um, facing click applications, you probably get audit requirements as well. And we see that a lot. Uh, what changes did you make? Were these changes authorized? Uh, who made those changes? And, and in order to answer that question, you have to do a lot of manual work again. Uh, work again. So, and that's not the only thing. You also want to capture knowledge, knowledge of who has done what, when, and why, especially when you have external 
uh, contractors uh, um, um, that, that do certain things uh, and they leave the organization again. Why did they make this change? What exactly did they do? So there are different reasons to say, hey, um, I want to streamline that whole development process. I want to have more insights of what's going on. And, and from a managerial perspective, I want to know um, uh, all the changes that have been made so that I can manage this process. And then zero touch version control comes in place because you want to create an efficient process, which means that you want um, click to be versioned at the lowest level possible uh, to know what's going on. And that could be uh, through seamless integration so that there's no shell on top of uh, ClickSense, but through the back end, everything is done automatically, even you don't know that that is happening, right? So uh, what we will sh show in the demo that we have a high granularity of change controls of individual apps, uh, of individual objects within the apps, and that you can restore them and deploy them. Okay. And then, of course, you want to have analytics over your development process uh, because we are BI specialists. We want to know what is going on, with what changes did we make, and we want to be able to report on that as well. So BI over BI can be very essential, uh, uh, important because you want to apply the same principles. Okay. So basically, um, if you want to influence the speed and the, and the cost of the click implementation and the delivery of click, it's about, of course, people, the people that have experts, uh, that, that have skills and are experts to, to deliver. We want to have processes in place, controls in place to make sure that we only apply the changes uh, that we need to apply, but also the technology um, that can help us to make this process um, efficient. Okay. And, and we see good results when people implement automated uh, version control because that gives people the confidence that changes are being tracked and also that they can make mistakes and that they can try things out um, and that if they make a mistake they don't have to make a copy before they can always roll back and uh, like Chirac uh, told us one of our customers that led uh, to innovations because people can make um, uh, decisions to try something and if it's not good they just roll it back okay so this is an introduction, what I want to give to version control, why it's important and uh, why I think that um, having that in place leads to not only efficiency, but also to innovation. So let's have a look and let's hand it over to uh, Luc Wade. So today we're gonna talk about version control and a little bit of deployment for ClickSense using Soter, which is a Modio product. Um, and I like to start these demos off in my ClickSense development environment, just so you have an idea of what we're working with here. I can tell you that my secretary in the back is excited to be on with uh, some fellow Europeans this morning. Um, so let's get started here. As you can see, I am in my data analysis stream and we are going to use this fleet surplus auction app for the purposes of this demonstration. So I will quickly open this app up and give you an idea of what the app contains. Uh, when this loads, you'll see that this app contains the objects that you would expect. We have three sheets, five bookmarks, and a story. I apologize that my ClickSense environment is running a little bit slow right now. It may have just rolled out of bed as well. So here we see our three sheets, our five bookmarks, and our story. And I will qu quickly click through these sheets just so that you can see that everything is working as expected. So now I'm gonna switch over to Soter, which is our version control and deployment solution for ClickSense. And if I do so, I'm already logged in. Um, this is the home page. And when I click on this explore button here, a panel will slide out that displays all of the various ClickSense environments that I have connected to this installation of Soter. And we just looked in my development environment. So if I click on development, we see all of the different QMC objects that Soter has under version control. 
And anything that you see in any of these menus can be deployed from one ClickSense environment to another. So we are versioning all of your data connections, all of your analytic connections, your click tags, custom properties, and extensions. And an exciting new update that we made to the product about three weeks ago is that we are now versioning your personal work apps and content as well. So if I click on personal work, um, in this environment, you can see that I have several users and we are versioning the uh, personal work apps for those users. If we back out here and take a look at the published apps in this environment and we navigate to this data analysis stream, we see the three apps in my data analysis stream in my development environment. And the app that we just looked at is this fleet surplus auction app. And this is where things start to get a little bit more exciting with Soter. So if I click on Fleet Surplus Auction, you'll see that in Soter, we split out all of the app's objects into individual groupings. And that essentially makes them first-class citizens and gives you a lot of flexi flexibility and um, control over not only versioning, but deployment as well. So for example, we have all three sheets under version control, your stories, your bookmarks. We also version private and community objects for published apps. And so you'll see folders there in the places that you would expect. If I double click on the app itself, that will take me to a property screen um, that displays the properties associated with the current published version of this app. We have a change history tab that shows all of the earlier versions of this app as well. So now I'm gonna go back into my ClickSense development environment. I am going to duplicate this app to my personal work area. And once it's there, I'm going to make the three classic types of changes. I am going to delete something, create something new and make an edit. So I have this app in my personal work area. If I open it up, I will start off by deleting a sheet and I'll delete this regional fleets sheet, a little bit of a tongue twister there. And now I need to create something new. So I'll open up the equipment data sheet, make a selection and create a new bookmark. And so we have this new demo bookmark at the bottom down here. And lastly, I need to edit something about this app. And so to do that, I'm going to open up the data load editor. And what you'll notice here is that the load script for this app contains two duplicate sets of variables. I am going to delete off the second set of duplicates. That's not going to have any functional impact on the data being loaded into this app but Soter will still pick up the change that I'm making. So we will reload the data here. And once that is successful, I am going to republish this app. And I will replace the existing version with this new version that we just created. Once this job completes, we will open the app up in my data analysis stream just to make sure that my changes have been passed on. So we now expect to see only two sheets um, and we expect to see that new demo bookmark as well. So we have just two sheets now. If I take a look at my bookmarks, we see that new bookmark at the bottom. So now let's switch back to Soter and take a look at how Soter has recorded those changes. So if I go back into Soter and we'll start from the top here, every ClickSense environment has a very handy feature called the timeline. So for my development environment where we just made those changes, if I open the timeline, we see at the top the three changes that I made. I created this new demo bookmark, I changed something about the app, and I deleted that regional fleet sheet. If we wanna dig a little bit deeper and see what I changed about the app, I can click on this row and click the compare to previous version button. And we see that I didn't change any properties 
of this app. But if I go to the load script, um, shaded in gray, we see that duplicate set of variables that was removed. And so now I'd, I'd like you to imagine that a month or two goes by and a user comes to me and says, hey, Luke, what happened to that regional fleet sheet? I don't use it very often, but that sheet was very important to me. It's very possible that in that time span, a lot of work has been done in this app. And so in an ideal world, I would like to recover that sheet without impacting any other component of the app. And Soter allows you to do exactly that. So if I want to recover that deleted sheet without impacting the other changes that I've made, then I will open up the change history for this regional fleet sheet. At the top here, we have a record of when the sheet was deleted. And if I'd like to recover just the sheet instead of rolling the entire app back, then I will select the previous version and click the restore button. And that's all that I have to do. So Soter is now recovering my regional fleets sheet. We can view that here. We are restoring version 11 of the sheet. And that will take uh, about 10 seconds or so to run. Um, and while that finishes up, I'd like to point out that you can also comment on these different versions. As you can imagine, this list can grow pretty long, pretty rapidly because we are actively versioning your apps. So as soon as an app is published or republished with a change, Soter is automatically picking up a new version of that app, as well as any individual objects that exist in that app. So if I want to comment on version 12 here, I can type, this was deleted by accident. And we now have a comment associated with this version, as well as a date and time that that comment was made and the user that, that made that comment. If I navigate to the deployment history tab, we see at the top here that that recovery job has finished. We recovered version 11 and that created version 13. So versions 13 and 11 are identical, but we want a record of that recovery. So if I go to the change history once again and refresh this interface, we see that new version at the top indicating that the sheet has been restored. If I go back into my development environment and open up the fleet surplus auction app one last time, we will see that the regional fleet sheet is back. Everything works as expected, um, including the new bookmark that I made just a few minutes ago, which is this demo bookmark. So that's how version control works in Soter. Um, one thing that I'd like to point out in addition is that those individual components can be deployed across environments as well. You don't have to deploy an entire app with Soter. You can pick and choose what you deploy. So the last thing that I'd like to show here is how that deployment process works. And to do so, we are going to deploy this new version of the Fleet Surplus Auction app from my development environment to my testing environment. I am already logged into my testing environment. And what you'll notice is I'm now here in my testing environment. This environment is essentially identical to my development environment, except it does not contain that fleet surplus auction app. So if I want to, to carry this deployment out, I will go back into Soter, navigate to my fleet surplus auction app, I can run the deployment from this pop-out menu here. I can also deploy from this main properties interface. And if I'd like to deploy an earlier version, I can do so by selecting that version and clicking the deploy button here. But for this demonstration, we're just going to deploy the currently published version of this app. So on the properties tab, I will click the deploy button. We want to deploy from development to testing. When I click next, this will take me to a deployment preview where we see at the top that we are deploying the fleet surplus auction app with an asterisk, which indicates that we are including descendants. We're including all of the individual components of the app. And we can see those by clicking the preview deployment button here. Um, and we see a full list of all of the objects that make up this app that will be deployed to my testing environment. 
So the preview looks good. I will click next and click next again. The last screen in this wizard is the execution mode. I can save this job and kick it off later in Soter or via REST API call. I could schedule this job to run later on, but we are just going to run this job right now. I'll click finish and that's all that I have to do. So my app is now being deployed from my development environment to my testing environment. And we can take a look at the items that we're deploying by clicking this view link. We see that we are deploying the app along with all of its components. And we will give this job about 10 or 15 more seconds to run here. Um, and then we'll take a look at the app in my testing environment. And that is all that I will be showing today. So if I go to the deployment history tab here, we see that this job is still running. This will finish up uh, very shortly. And we will take a look. One additional functionality that I'll speak to just for a moment while this finishes up is that you also have the ability to undo these deployments, which we will see in just a moment. And by doing so, that will restore everything in my target environment to exactly the way that things were before I carried this deployment up. So we see that this job has now finished. We deployed version 11 of the app from my development environment, which created version one in my testing environment because the app did not exist. If I wanted to undo the deployment, I can do so here. And if I want to take a look at everything that was deployed over, I can view this deployment. And we have a side-by-side -side look of every version of every object in my source development environment and the version that that created in my target environment. If I go into my testing environment, um, that app has now been deployed. So if I click away and click back, we see that the app has arrived here um, and everything works as expected. So uh, what, I, what I wanted to do initially was ask the three of you to um, sort of introduce yourselves and explain the roles that you have in your organization. So, um, well, Sarah, can we start with you? Um, yeah, so I manage the management information team at CFC Underwriting. Um, we're an insurance company. Um, we've been using Click for about two and a half years now. Um, it's very well received. Everyone was very excited about it and still are and fighting over licenses. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Megan? Um, yeah, I'm the ClickSense product owner for Somerset Bridge. So we're an insurance and broking company as well. And I oversee Click and how it's used across all the businesses and managing the software and the users and access and everything like that. Okay, thank you. Father Christmas. <laughs> thanks, Neil. Uh, well, thanks to everybody uh, for inviting us along and, uh, and uh, hello everyone. Um, so uh, as Neil uh, says, my name is Father Christmas. Sorry, Andy Chalk. Um, I work for Ruffer, which is a wealth management firm primarily in London. Uh, well who's anywhere these days, but uh, the, a few international offices as well. Um, so we manage uh, uh, money on behalf of investors or private clients or charities or pension funds, that kind of thing. Uh, my role is uh, has been as an analyst developer and I transitioned into leading the BI team uh, just over a year ago now. Um, and uh, so ClickView was our primary BI software. And uh, in the last couple of years, we've uh, migrated to use ClickSense, uh, which remains our primary uh, uh, delivery for a BI. Good stuff. No, thank you very much. Yeah, it's useful for it all. Thank you very much. So I was just going to ask uh, yeah, a few questions of each of you to start with, and then we'll see if we uh, get any questions that are coming in from the uh, attendees. So uh, Sarah, if I can start with you again. So we, which which part of the business is Click being used in predominantly at the moment? And um, so we have mainly our team leaders. Um, we find the more senior, the more people want to use it and understand what's on there. So, um, yeah, it's just our senior staff at the moment. OK. And, and what sort of source systems are they bringing that data in from? 
Um, so we have a SQL database or a few SQL databases that we pull together using Click. Um, so we do all the work behind it and then we just have them as the end users basically. Okay, okay, no, that's useful. Um, and then uh, Megan, what, which parts of the business is Click being used in at Somerset Bridge? Um, well, it was originally adopted for um, like the stats and actuarial teams and for okay. some Excel static reporting so you can filter in more. But it's actually been picked up a lot by um, our call centres. So we get a lot okay. of the team right. members there use it to look at their agent performance and some yep. of data and stuff like that. So. so is that coming from the phone system itself, the, that data, or it, is it a CRM solution? Um, we we use SAS as our yep. big like, data management tool as well as SQL. So we have a lot of stuff. Unfortunately, Click doesn't talk to SAS directly, but we do a lot of exports from SAS as part of our daily processing to a CSV, and then we pick that up into Click. Right. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, and I, I understand one of the things that um, you guys are looking into, I know Andy touched on it briefly, is potentially widening out to people outside of your organisation as well. Is that, um, is that progressing? Yeah. The past couple of weeks have really kicked off that project. Um, so we've got an external company that we work with and they want access to some of their data, but in the reports that we've already built in Click. Okay. So okay. Trying to set that up for them. It's a whole other access question, using a lot of sets and access to make it possible. Yeah, absolutely. So so you're going to give them access to actual uh, ClickSense dashboards rather than just static reports, or is that still to be decided? Yeah. So things like the triangle triangle reports, we usually send them yep. they the static, so they know that if they've got it on ClickSense, they can dive in and have it daily, and that's what we're trying to get to. Oh, fantastic! Oh, that sounds good. That sounds good. Uh, and 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 Andy, I, I know a little bit more about um, your deployment, but uh, can you just talk us through the sort of areas of the business that uh, are using Click? Um, yeah, so historically, uh, Click was brought in about 10 years ago by the ops department. So very much low level kind of, of uh, oversight of data and kind of reconciliations and all sorts of strange things. Um, ops covers quite a, a remit and still our biggest user um, uh, base. In it. Primarily, I think, because they've got familiarity with the tool, they understand its capabilities. Um, but then, uh, latterly, uh, but, but but equally, um, we were our core internal reporting for the executive and kind of senior members of the uh, the front office teams um, have, have for quite a while been uh, long-standing consumers of uh, of the, the capabilities that Click can deliver. Um, okay. And more recently, we've uh, engaged with the dealing desk. Actually, they've been very um, very um, very keen to take it on, um, and they actually kind of help to inform the research department um, through uh, information about our dealing activity. So the investments the firm is making on behalf of its clients or into our funds or out of our funds, that kind of thing. And also business business development. Um, they, they've engaged with us uh, primarily because they were, they were doing some Excel based analysis and the, the volume of data was just so great that uh, Excel just couldn't cope. Um, and uh, it's turned into our biggest project this year, actually, um, uh, and very well received already with what we've delivered so far. Um, still plenty to do, but uh, yeah. Um, oh, so uh, quite widely across the firm, actually. There's still areas we don't quite, um, we haven't uh, got really good engagement with yet, but um, I think that'll change over time. And one of the things we've been doing is working on um, kind of the visibility of Click and, and what it can do and what the team can help uh, Click deliver for them. So. Yeah, so that sounds very good. Um... Coming back to you, Sarah, for a moment then, uh, one of the questions, I, I guess this is for all three of you really, but uh, one of the questions has been asked um, of the panel, how, how do you best deal with users with a wide range of technical ability? Which is always, uh, um, kind of... we do, well, yeah, we do a lot of training um, course, like just kind of slideshows and stuff for people to run through it. Um, and we spend quite a lot of time sitting with the teams to, or team leaders to go through things um, and actually show them where to, to get things from. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. Megan, similar sort of story. Yeah, I think so. Um, obviously, we can't sit with people as easily anymore. So there's a lot of screen sharing. Uh, no. No. Looking for. Um, 
we are starting to try and build some help apps in that kind of default everyone's stream so that you can look in there and get some tips and some links to some of the online courses as yep. well. Yep, and I, oh, okay. I, I have to bow down now. The MD has arrived. I'd better be quiet. No, no, He's I just, uh, you, know, you know, I can't stay quiet for too long. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> No, so it's just taking an interpretation of that question as well, maybe, uh, and going further. So do you tailor any of your applications to suit people with less ability or less technical knowledge, less data literacy? Maybe that's how I'd interpret that question is, you know, you do the training courses and things like that to bring everybody up to a level. But do you have to do anything with the creation of your dashboards to tailor for people? You know, do you employ um, things like we showed on that SAS, that kind of ask insight advisor so that people can just get the insights they need? C can you answer it on that kind of basis? Um, Shall I go? Well, oh, yeah, go for it, Andy. I go, Megan. <laughs> okay. But our reports, we definitely have different levels. So the ones that tend to go to team managers and um, agents themselves that are a lot more just here's a table of data like you're used to, and we've got some basic filters and the date picker they quite like. Whereas the more complicated ones for the actuarial team tend to have a lot more filters, and we'll build things like. Um, uh, master measures an item so that they can use that sort of functionality as well. Right. I think I'd, I'd add to that say that the, the, the click sense um, it, it is a it is a great step forward from click view in terms of um, the reception it's got in terms of, of usability. Um, but I think the key thing is engaging with the users and stakeholders um, on requirements uh, that they understand their part of the business better than we do. Um, and, of, uh, and as has been pointed out, the range of ability uh, um, or, or maybe engagement is a better word than ability in some cases, um, means that you, you, in some cases you really do need to sit with people and kind of hold the hand through the process of, of kind of building whatever it is they need and, and delivering a dashboard or, or, or a report, whatever it might be. Um, whereas other people, you can give them the raw data and they're so up for it that they run away and create a dozen extra sheets with with visualizations left right and center and that's brilliant when you get that kind of user and um, yeah. that kind of stakeholder and, and and they've just seen the possibilities and they're running with it but of course every firm and every team has has all sorts of abilities and you just have to tailor it i think but the product itself lets you do that which is brilliant that's what we need i guess is, is a malleable tool that will do the job for those different levels yeah, I, I think uh, Chris Lofthouse did a blog, didn't he, about um, asking questions within uh, within the title of, um, of uh, charts as well. I don't know if you um, employ any of that, but that, that certainly worked well at a couple of customers I've spoken to, whereas instead of just saying this is sales, you know, they will put in a question so that um, the user can have some idea of what the developer was uh, trying to provide them with. Um, that, that that seems to work well with with people. Um, what what would you say is your biggest challenge to date, Sarah? What uh, in in terms of rolling it out? Um, I think the biggest challenge is I think we've got the group of people who really use this a lot, and we've got a group of people that um are less willing to and still want to rely on us quite a lot. And That's very turn, diplomatic. I think we, <laughs> <laughs> um, in turn, I think we also really struggle with time. So I think when we first um, deployed Click, we spent a lot of time setting up the initial dashboards. Um, and I think we do have a lot that we still need to do. And I, but where all the other work kind of takes over, we struggle to um, spend enough time on Click to get all the things done that I want to do and we're actually in the process now of building out our team a little bit to so that we've got more time to do oh, this. so hopefully we'll have oh, a click soon yeah yeah <laughs> okay um because I, I certainly uh, uh, Megan I, I I don't know your setup as well but I know with Andy you were looking at having sort of champions in each department weren't you at one point did you did you go down that route in the end um, so this is quite interesting. It's the whole, so this is closely linked, I think, to self-service as well. Um, so it's great to talk about self-service, um, but I think I, I have to be honest. When we when we uh, when we undertook the, the ClickSense migration project, that was a key part of what we were hoping to deliver for for people. But of, 
Yeah, well, our realization along that journey has been that there's a, there's a great variety of, of um, willingness to do that. So, so self-service really is a multiple, multiple different things for different people, different teams. So yep. the example I gave with the dealing desk there, where they're really keen, um, yeah, making visualizations, kind of re really just doing their own thing. Um, didn't really need much help from us beyond getting a good data model together and a bit of training. Um, right. Sorry, I've strayed off the subject, haven't I? So I've gone on self-service. What was your original question? <laughs> sorry. Yeah, I, I can't remember either. <laughs> Um, no, I, I was talking about the sort of biggest challenges that you faced. Yeah, and um, so yeah, so some people honestly, um, it's, they really just just want the data. They, they're really not interested in how they get it, what the tool is. They just want to get an answer to a question, whatever that might be, um, and it may be complex, maybe more than one question. Clearly, um, whereas other people really want to get down and dirty with the data, really want to understand it, really want to see what it can give them. Um, and it's engaging people at that level, I think. And it's not easy when you've got a small team yourself, as Sarah's maybe talking about, and needing more resources. Um, but you do what you can to, to 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 interact with the people where they're at. I think you can't expect somebody to be, you know, some sort of SQL expert or, or you know, some amazing visualization designer if that's not their core job. They, they may no. have absolutely no interest in that and no time for it. So that's where we come in, obviously, to do those things. Whereas, you know, for the dealing desk, brilliant. We'll give you we'll give you your data and a bit of toing and froing about uh, bits and pieces. But for the most part, they, they, they're self-serving, loving the loving the product and just getting on with it, really. Yeah, no, no. It's, uh, yeah, they, you, you're right. You strike a good point there around uh, data literacy that Andy uh, touched on. I mean, M Megan, do you find that in your business? Are there different levels of data literacy that you need to help people with? Um, not really. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Does that imply that they're all can experts? <laughs> I can work there. No, I think they just, um, data is kind of the core of our business. It's what we build everything out of and that they right. already have a handle on their data. It's more just getting it to present in the way that they want and make it the most useful for them. Okay, no, that's well. That is encouraging to hear because I have to say it is a, a a challenge that we face when we talk to some of our customers and prospects. In that, like like you just said there, Andy, you know, some people are very keen to get involved and, and others less so, and you have to try and cater for all of them along the line. Um, but uh, yes, it is a it, it it can be a challenge. Um, so moving on to the software itself. Um, Sarah, what, what would you say has been your favourite new feature over the last 12 months or so? Put you on the um, spot. I think... It gives the others time to think got, about it. <laughs> um, we haven't got to using it yet, but I think it's a really good thing that we'll use a lot is the alerts. Um, yes. Yep. And I think it will be really good for um, people to be able to set them up themselves without having to rely on us as well. Um, yep. And I think we'll use that for all sorts of things, like notifying large claims and... So at the moment, a lot of things that we do using an imprinting report, I think we can transfer using those alerts. Yep. Yep. No, no, I, 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 yeah, excited about that. I think that's a really good piece of uh, kit that's coming along. Yep. Um, Megan, what about you? Uh, mine was more basic, just the custom tool tips. I always found them okay. very, but okay. now they've expanded that a lot more. And I really appreciate it. Yeah. No, that's good. That's good. Uh, Andy. I dare ask. Uh, it, it was, <laughs> thank you. The alerts, definitely the alerts for us. Yeah. Uh, again, we haven't okay. actually climbed into it yet, but uh, yeah, it looks really good. Oh, that's good. Oh, that's very encouraging. So, um, touching on, yeah, we're, we're we're all sitting in the middle of the pandemic at the moment, aren't we? Unfortunately, going to be here with us for a while. Has it has it affected your businesses at all, and um, it, how you're using Click to overcome that at all, Sarah? People using it remotely, perhaps, or? Yeah, so we've got people using it remotely and we did use it a lot, especially at the start, to really drill down on per day the inquiries we're receiving, um, claims related to coronavirus. It's been really good to help people drill down on um, the effects of coronavirus itself. Okay, okay. Megan, has it been much of an effect on you guys? Um, I think we've been quite lucky as a company. It hasn't. Right. Too much of an impact on 
Oh, that's good to hear. Yeah, it's good to hear because uh, yeah, you certainly hear horror stories from else elsewhere on at times. Um, hey, go on then, Andy. You, <laughs> uh, no, no. Likewise, the firm has been uh, thankfully um, uh, really unaffected. Our revenue stream uh, remains intact. So um, uh, obviously, some some uh, some massive um, investment in uh, remote working as we had capability before um, the lockdown, uh, but but clearly not for 300 people all at once. So uh, that that yeah. was quite interesting, but uh, didn't really impact us um, in the BI team directly. Um, in terms of our our day-to-day -day work um okay. other than perhaps perhaps the um uh, the business development side of things um yeah as it's a very active part of the firm and uh yeah they, they just kind of changed the way they work clearly because it's all remote now so yes but not yeah, really yeah. the short answer is not really it's uh, it's pretty much just doing it at a different desk Okay, no, it's really encouraging to hear. I think we've had a similar experience, so uh, yeah, can't can't complain about that. Um, so, what one of the things, Andy, that you talked about earlier was that you've made the move from Click View to Click Sense, and I think uh, from memory it was about six to twelve months ago, I guess, something like that. Um, oh, a bit more than that, actually. It was late twenty eighteen. Is it really? Where, yeah, no, can you believe it? When we were um, initially looking at um, yeah, what we would do uh, next, because we had ClickView had had it for a decade. Do you want, do you want to speak a little bit about it? OK. Yeah, please, um, if you would. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yes. So, um, yeah, so we evaluated a few different um, alternatives uh, to uh, to ClickView. One of them obviously being ClickSense. Um, Tableau and Power BI ended up being on the short list. Um, I think the decision wasn't that hard because although they, the others are great products, uh, the reality is when when you have a, a team with embedded skills in one area and a, a user base that's used to using software of a particular type, albeit it is a new product, it's very familiar for going from ClickView to ClickSense. Um, okay. So ClickSense won out um, and then 2019, uh, was a year largely of a migration project. So we, we deliberately approached it as a manual migration because we had a new member on the team and we wanted him to upskill on the uh, kind of the, the, the subject matter. Um, yep. So so the business side of things. So um, yeah, we ended up migrating roughly half of our existing new capability. Half of it had become redundant over that decade, uh, been superseded or, or, or in some way or other. Um, but there were a lot of uh, interesting drivers behind the decision, I think, um, not least of all um, the capability around the multiple different data sources. Um, you know, being able to connect to Mongo. So we use NoSQL databases quite extensively in the firm for, for various things. Um, and so uh, having a, a connector for that was brilliant. Uh, use Oracle, SQL, and loads of Excel. Uh, too much Excel. We'd love to get rid of some of it, but uh, it lives on. Um, but yeah, overall, it was it was a really good experience. Obviously, you guys helped us immensely with that, um, with the, the training and the upskilling and, um, you know, just understanding. I think it was an interesting time. I don't think we'd have done it much earlier. ClickSense wasn't really that, you know, it's come on a long way in the two years, let's put it that way, uh, with yep. new features and um, improving capability. But, um, but from the off, it was already a massive improvement. Uh, the, the, the other key things we liked was the self-service seemed a lot easier. So it would be easy to engage people with that. Uh, and the cloud and mobile um, side of things, which is uh, a direction of travel for us. So, as a firm, yes. yeah, okay. And, and, and have any of the three of you um, looked to do anything with the the mobile side of it? So, you know, getting people to use it on tablets, mobile phones, or anything like that. Is is, is that a uh, a requirement for you yet? Interestingly, so there's, uh, I'll, if I may just start um, as a, as a monorail. <laughs> uh, we started a proof of concept for this earlier in the year and ironically covid came along and lockdown actually put the kibosh on it temporarily <laughs> oh, right. uh, there were other priorities within the within the firm so uh, yeah it's one we hope to resurrect soon but um yeah okay. it, it obviously makes makes sense but we know we haven't actually got there yet okay all right uh, megan are you anything on the no nothing on that side <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> um Okay, uh, well, let's look at a few more questions from the um, from the from the floor. So, um, end, end printing, yeah. So all three of you actually use end printing. So, uh, Megan, I think you guys use it quite considerably, don't you? Do you you just run us through the sort of things that you're doing with it? Um, 
yeah, we've got quite we've got some reports that go out hourly that can replace um, SSRS reporting that we had in the past, and right. we've got reports that um, are like monthly archives. We've got some reports that used to be run through SAS, which took about a day to run, and now we've got them. So I've been imprinting, which is really helpful. And then, sure. and then some exception reporting as well. I use it for my quick monitoring, so I get alerts if there's an engine down or a user's done something wrong or something like that. So. Yep. Yep. Which sounds similar to what you do, Sarah. Does it with your alerting through end printing? Yeah, we do a lot of that. And um, we've also had so someone from the claims team who used to do MI for claims has um been on maternity leave so before she went on maternity leave we got a lot of her regular reporting into end printing which is really helpful um okay. so i don't know if she's going to come back and do that. <laughs> 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 but um yeah no it's been quite handy for that because we've not had to have someone sitting there doing it all manually it just all runs and that was quite quite a chunk of her job really um which was really good news um, and yeah, we're just everything that we try to we do regularly. We try to get in there just to stop us having to touch it at all, which has been really good. No, it's good. And 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 Megan, you touched on it a little bit earlier. So, are, are you all finding a trend where people are looking to move away from static reports, and they're now be, as they become more comfortable with a with an interactive dashboard? Yes, definitely. Um, and in printing, we actually used we started using the on print on demand. Button. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so some reports used to be like monthly. They'd look at them, and then if they wanted more information, they'd have to ask us to get it. But now they can use the daily dashboard that yeah. we fill, put in their filters, and then build the same report we used to send them, but just for the data that they want. Yeah, and explore it however they wish. Oh, that's good. And then that's they'll good. export it through end, end printing, which is really helpful. Yep. Yep. Uh, and Andy, are you guys using end printing? Uh, we are, but it's taken a bit of a back seat towards the push to self-service dashboards, yep. um, okay. uh, which is interesting. That said, I think it's more an area we've just not been focusing or not been prioritising because it, it would be useful. There's definitely things that we could use more of that for. Okay. Uh, what about the, you know, touching on that way you're saying people are wanting to come in and, uh, you know, uh, ask questions of the data. So what, what about the conversational analytics that Andy showed you all earlier? Can you see your users using that? Megan, that was a slightly uh, <laughs> doubtful look. <laughs> what, what, what's your thinking there? I know every conversation we have with you guys is you should be using the Insight Advisor and conversation yeah. <laughs> been rolled out with us yet. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. And uh, Sarah, can you see your guys using using that side of it? Um, so we've not used any of it yet. I, I. Possibly, yeah. I do think um, one thing people struggle with as well is finding where to find a certain stat and things. So maybe it would help with that. Um, right. Okay. Yeah, possibly something to look into. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Andy, is he, your guys? Uh, no, we're, we're late to the party with that one, I think. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, okay, but it would well, be really, yeah, I could see how it would be really useful for some people, others and not so much. Less so. Okay, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, that's fair enough. That's why they're having this whole broad you know, platform that people can interact in different ways. Um, another question from the floor. So do, do any of you have users that want live data, i.e. up to the minute results? And, and, and how do you handle that? Megan, you want to go first on that one? Um, We're building a. Oh, sorry. At the moment, and uh, we do the taking on all of finance reporting, um, and they are keen to get live data. At the moment, we've just done it to run every fifteen minutes, um, okay. which seems to be good. But it would be good if, at some point, that was a possibility. Yeah, to bring that in. Okay, okay. Megan, you have similar sorts of you can say nodding away there. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of the same. We have quite a few reports now that go into the SQL databases that um, they used to run an on-demand SSRS report whenever they wanted, but we had yep. so many running the same report, it was hitting the servers really hard. So as now we've got this one 
click at, which does all the data every 10 minutes. Um, right. It's still a bit handy because we have to do things like um, export in the early morning, we'll export all the history, and then during the day, it will just add the day's worth of data and put it all together. Okay. Um, oh, going to get chipped in. But it's as loud as we can get. <laughs> Yeah, now I was just going to tackle this from a uh, technical point of view as well, <clears throat> and I am not the most technical person in our organisation, as everybody on the call knows. But I talked about those dynamic views um, during the presentation, and and admittedly there aren't a lot of our customers that are using them. But essentially, there is part of the Click platform that if you're getting um, and this is all about where you're getting your data from. So there's no point going to a um, data warehouse if that data warehouse is only updated once a night anyway. Um, and it's whether or not you're going directly to source in order to get that real time information or you've got something like the integration capability with Click with that chained data capture in order to get that data ready to be streamed into the dashboard. But so it's kind of a two stage two-stage mechanism if you want to be able to do that it's having the right um, data being prepared in the right way and then you can use something like dynamic views within ClickSense so one chart one visualization can be constantly streaming back to that data warehouse whilst the rest of the application is only updated every 15 minutes or once a night so technically it's doable to address the question that's been asked but it might not necessarily be as easy as just switching on dynamic views there's got to be some data preparation and some foresight into where that data is coming from and what impact it will have on the source systems in order to get it real time so just wanted to add that into the mix okay thank you thank you um i mean i, I guess the three the three of you are on the panel have you got questions for each other as well oh good one because we, we're getting everybody to ask you things. Are there things that you're curious about? That uh, how are the people who are using the software? Well, I guess Megan, you're. Um, I think you said you're like the product manager. Is that do you, is your job solely both of you solely on click, or do you have a whole another job as well? <laughs> um, well, I'm part of the central uh, management information. Team. And then as we got quick, rolled out more and more, it became a very large part of my daily job. So I still do some other automated reporting through different software, but it is largely Click Admin because there's now so much of it. We've got three different MI teams that use it and then a whole bunch of other new developers coming in and all sorts of uh, governance that needs doing. So I do a lot of that. Yeah. 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 Exactly thing, Megan. yeah. <laughs> Governance for all three of you, I guess, is key, isn't it? Being in the sort of financial yeah. services arena. Yeah. Um, what about you, Andy? Yeah, for, for me, um, so the bulk of my day is uh, BI related, um, and, and obviously, Click takes up a lot of that. Well, Click and Jira and uh, uh, and planning and documentation. You know how it is, Megan. <laughs> it's not just all <laughs> about Click, um, but. Um, uh, but also, I, I, I kind of have another foot in the wider stream that we're a part of. So we're a part of the wider data stream within technology at, at Ruffer. So uh, I get to build some other stuff on the kind of in-house platform we built there as well. So, so Click isn't okay. our only way of getting data uh, to people within the firm. Uh, and that has similar capabilities um, in terms of uh, being able to access multiple different types of data and merge them together. So, but we, had, uh, we built that alongside Click. And obviously, as it's an in-house thing, it basically costs us well wages rather than uh, software royalties or whatever you want to call them. Okay, no, no, fair enough. Megan, do you have any questions of the others, or um, does anyone use wallboards? I'm going to use it as this is a knowledge base now. We're looking. Does no. Have any? You said you, Sarah, that you have a lot of management who use the software senior management more so with that all the questions we always get from the higher up in the company is oh i want like a dashboard that just sits there and then blinks at me when something's wrong or that right. sort of floating do you guys do any of that no but we okay we say, no. they don't we 
we do have customers that do do that. I can I can jump in there. So um, yeah, a, a across a wide range of industries as well. So we've got uh, a manufacturing customer of ours where they've got, um, uh, like you say, a big wall uh, screen. I, I'm assuming you're talking about big screens here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so they're showing them, you know, uh, the performance of the different flow lines and things like that. We've got another uh, company that uh, distributes out to retail. So a bit more actually along your uh, thing that you talked about earlier, Megan, where they're measuring the number of calls that people are taking, how successful those calls have been, you know, how many orders they've got on hold and all this sort of thing. And it, even in, well, we don't have it anymore because we, we've obviously closed the office down. But when we were in the office, we had a big screen up that used to show us you know, how many support calls we've got open, um, how many uh, opportunities we've got underway, you know, sales that we've made, um, utilization of people. So, yeah, we find those very useful of, of, of a way of getting information out to people quickly. Mm. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, sorry, yes, and Andy's just pointed out to me on the chat as well that um, one of our customers has a touch screen, so they'll hold meetings around a click screen so that they can talk interactively with it at the, at the time. Um, so uh, we've got 10 minutes left, haven't we? Or coming towards the end anyway. So what sort of plans do you have for Click over the next 12 months? Andy, let's start with you this time. Oh, you're in the tricky one. Well, um, so as I said, we've got this uh, uh, quite considerable project with the business development team. Um, it's kind of merging data from two very different avenues and approaches and business processes. So, it, um, so that's ongoing. Um, uh, that it, so this is just to give a bit of background on that. It, it, it's Excel data, as I said, and it's um, um, it's a basic external investor information. So people who don't have a direct investment mandate with Ruffer. So, um, okay. so that data is kind of third-party data, but it comes yep. from different administrators, very different. Uh, um, and also the way the teams work. So that's quite an interesting project. So that's what we're working on there. Um, end printing is something we definitely want to uh, engage with more because it will obviously free up time for us and, and potentially uh, others. Um, so uh, produ in, uh, introducing some efficiencies there would be good. And okay. the mobile, click on mobile, I think that's the other thing. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Okay. The uh, version control, funnily enough. <laughs> oh, right. Okay. Okay. So is that was just that just to de-risk that, that, that? Yeah, yeah. That session was useful for the three of you earlier, was it? It was actually yeah, very useful. Thanks to the guys, uh, and thanks for getting up at three a.m. I unfortunately didn't have to do that today. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Hence, time for a shave. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good. Yes, absolutely. Um, so, uh, Megan, similar, similar sort of question to yourself. What? How do you see yourselves expanding your use of Click over the next twelve months? Um, well, as mentioned, we're looking at getting some access for external users. Yeah, yeah. I think that's um, quite open. Started small, but I can see it expanding. Expanding that, yeah. Okay. Yeah. We've also recently trained some of our actuarial team in building their own reports in Quick to measure the output of models and stuff like that. Okay, okay. That will start being used more and more and be more helpful to them. And there's more um, of that sort of actuarial or like statistical friend lines and stuff coming into click recently so that would be quite helpful yeah, for them. yeah i think well, uh, sorry i'll come back to the next question sarah I'll, I'll ask the same of you first um so like i said before we're kind of in the process of making sure that there's no mi being created outside of our team so we've been yeah. really working on that and i think given the opportunity where we've got a separate finance system at the moment to kind of join them together for the first time and get a really good look at what's going on on that side and um, definitely on demand end printing reports we want to build out throughout all of our dashboards which we're not doing yep. at the moment yep. um, and we've got a, a new um, incident response app for cyber claims so we want to do quite a lot of reporting on that and see how it's being used and um, who okay. buy and things like that. Yeah, no, no, okay. Um, we need to talk to you, get you to talk to Chris as well. He's um, done some work on uh, triangles apps as well, claims triangle apps. So, uh, oh, yeah. 
that we can uh, we'll get him to have a chat to you about that. What about, I mean, all three of you, I would have thought, um, do you do any forecasting or is, it, is that likely to, um, you know, going out to um, things like, um, you know, R and Python for bringing in future data and, and, and forecasting things into the, into the future? Is that of interest to the, any of you? Yeah, so it's something that um, uh, Vic, as you know, uh, in the team is very keen on, um, especially he's kind of our, our data science um, evangelist. Um, yep. the, the tricky thing we found is that obviously to spend time on something, there has to be a, a business imperative for it, a business priority yep. for it. And it, it's finding the application for you know, machine learning, data science, whatever you want to call it. Um, so so it, the, the, the killer thing for us to, to be able to really pursue that will be finding an application for it. But it's, it's a really big field. Um, yeah. But projections are such slightly simpler things, I, I guess. And so Python integration is something that uh, we're, we're looking at with our uh, kind of development office because they've got a platform for that already. Um, for getting, uh, so, but that's a relatively new development within the firm. Um, okay. We have some existing Python capability, but this is kind of standardizing it so we don't all have to install Python on our desktops and, uh, and yeah. all of the joy that yeah. brings. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, yeah, but yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely something, um, it's more than on the radar, but it's not really a project yet. It's, it's yeah, um, but but we're keen to, to really move into data science alongside Click, yeah. Yeah, and predict, predictive analytics, I guess, is the right way yeah. to term it, isn't it? Is that of any interest in your uh, realm, Megan? Is it? something you could see you guys doing? Um, definitely, it's something that's been sat there, noted down, click is, we can do this in click if you want to. It's just, I think, yep. finding the, the data science team. As I said, they've been trained, they were part of the training we had recently, and they already oh, okay. use right. their models. Um, it's just finding time in their workload, I think, to then take the next steps to move it into click and get it all set up in their market point of yep. view as well. No, no, okay. You, you make a. I, I'm jumping around a little here now. To apologies, but yeah, I noticed you said there about the training that you've had recently. So all three of you have used our um, our new sort of online platform of delivering training. Is that a is that a useful tool for you? Is it, we can't all get together unfortunately anymore. But um, can you see you guys using that for you know training some of your end users perhaps in the end? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, if, I, uh, I didn't realise it's going to be available. Sorry, Sarah, off to you. Sorry, sorry, I think I've got a delay. <laughs> yeah, there is a slight delay on your. Uh, <laughs> no worries. Um, yeah, we found it all really good, and I think especially for like the more junior members of my team, it's been a really good way of teaching them without me having to sit through and go through with them. So it's been really great for us. Okay, no, that's good. And uh, are there any other? of those sorts of courses that you think would be useful for us to put together? Sorry, no, they're that? all perfect. Well done, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> well, Andy, I think you've frozen. I think we've, oh no, we've lost Father Christmas. Come back. Uh, no, oh no, I'm, I'm here. I know, you say, you so, guys. So we, we, we talked, we talked to you, didn't we, about doing stuff with the um, the APIs and things like that. That's that's another one that we're exploring. Yes. Yeah. So it'd be good to pursue that further. I, I think the, uh, the 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 question was exactly what we'd cover in that because it's quite a broad topic, and obviously a, a, a course can only cover so much. So um, uh, we've actually got a, a really good use case for that, which was this other in-house platform we have is actually consumed. So it has its own kind of data set kind of it's a JSON thing. Um, okay. So actually consuming that would be, uh, be quite a good use case, I think, for that. So, uh, and, and give us the ability to 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 push or pull data, you know, pull data from that framework into click or indeed push um, click data into uh, into the other framework. So I think okay. that's where we're going with that. So yeah, that could be a really useful uh, thing, but I think it's pretty bespoke, isn't it, the API training that you, that you have well, in mind? It, it has to be, unfortunately, because there's so many different APIs. But um, yeah, we, we'll, we, we're trying to think of ways that we can standardise that as best we can. But uh, yeah, it's not a not an easy thing to standardise, unfortunately. Andy, you came jumping in there. Andy Patrick, sorry, you. What, what no, no, I, 
<laughs> Not at all, no, I'm just uh, conscious that we're getting close towards uh, wrap up. We've got our workshop starting at one o'clock. Um, I, I evangelize about click. I, I sort of stole the positives about it, but you know, a question has come in and I think it needs answering is, What's missing? What is it that you wish was in Click that's not there? Because it's not the perfect product, it's fantastic. Lots of people on the call today have got Click, but if you could implement one thing, what would it be or what's missing from Click? Nothing, there you go. Uh, it's perfect. Do you want me to pick <laughs> on someone? Egan, you go first. <laughs> what, what, what could we? What could be implemented that would make your life easier sat within the Click platform? Um, well, from a selfish point of view, developer point of view, I'd really like it if tasks had start and end times. Um, but probably for more for users, I, I think the searching, search, filtering selections has a lot of capability. You've got lots of advanced searching options, but I think it's quite difficult for an end user to they don't necessarily have the time to learn how to do all of them. If there was some prompting there, I think that would be helpful. Okay. Okay, super. Andy, anything that's missing from Click? What would you implement if uh, you had free reign on that? <laughs> Magic dashboards that make themselves, mate. That'd be brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, it Can shows you some of Magic that? dashboards, Rory. <laughs> that should be your takeaway, Mr. Patrick. Um, no, so. Um, Actually, you're asking the wrong person. I don't get that hands on. So, um, yeah, I'm sure Vic or, or Ryan could give you some some good ideas, but uh, maybe maybe they'll mail them in afterwards. I'll, I'll get to send you a list. But I, we'll for me, it, it's it's a great pro a great product. So, uh, yeah. So the the limitations that are there, uh, and undoubtedly there are some. Um, uh, yeah, I'm I'm not best placed to answer. Yeah, no problem, Sarah. What about you? Is there anything that you would add into the Clip product? Um, mine's probably a really simple, silly one, but I think um, just kind of, yeah, fonts um, and colours just m make them easier to change rather than having to set up the whole theme and uh, things like that, really, just to make it yeah. look a more kind of style of your own. More more granular brand. control on the formatting. It, it's coming, it's on the yeah. roadmap and there's bits of it each version, but yeah, we take that on board, absolutely. So, okay, no, that, that's really good. I'll uh, I'll leave you be, I'll leave you in Neil's safe hands now. Yeah, well, I was gonna say, well, you stay there only for a bit, because we, I think we're pretty much wrapped up. That's uh, 12.30 near enough. So thank you all very much for your, for your time in joining and uh, taking the questions from everybody. I hope we didn't uh, put you on the spot too much. Um, and, and to everybody else who's still uh, with us on the call, thank you very much for attending. Uh, those that aren't jumping off now to the uh, workshops, you know, thank you. We will be sending out uh, a follow-up survey via email along with your ebook as well. Um, so please complete that if there's other things you want us to uh, you know, give you more information about or you want a follow-up demo of any of it. Uh, you're more than you're more than welcome to ask for that. And um, yeah, just thank you again for attending. Those on the workshop, we'll see you at uh, one o'clock.